Greetings, everybody. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to be able to come together and to worship God <coughs> and wherever you are. We are going to a part three of this sermon series. Actually, it started with uh, Pastor Mike, this on the life and ministry of Jesus. If you remember, three weeks ago, Pastor Mike talked about the marriage in Cana, uh, more than enough, that powerful sermon. And then followed last week by Jillian when she talked about when Christ opened the book of Isaiah and then read the scriptures and told us that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the Jubilee. And this is the part three. If you haven't seen or heard of those sermons, check our YouTube channel. I mean, I enjoy them. They're great. So I'm advertising them to you <laughs> at this time. So last week, as I mentioned, um, Jesus started out, as mentioned by Jillian, telling people about the kingdom of God. And after he, he was going from town to town, he came back to this place called Nazareth. And on the Sabbath, he went to the synagogue. And um, during the service, Jesus read a passage from the prophet Isaiah, which Gillian read last time. He told them that uh, he's the one that Isaiah was talking about. That's what he was mentioning, that he is the Messiah. So that's where last week's uh, reading ended. But the story goes on today, this gospel story. You know, one of the blessings of reading the story of Jesus is whenever we open our Bible and read the story of Jesus, we get to know more about who God is. In addition, we also get to know about who we are and what God expects of us. That's why it's precious to, to go and study the scripture. The Bible tells us a lot about many things, but it is focused on Jesus. So when I Jesus read this uh, story, it sounded like a point of view from Luke, from that side. And I was, as I was studying and researching this, I came upon a children's sermon. <laughs> by Gary Nielsen, I thought, whoa, this is a good paraphrase of the story, and I'd like to share it with you because in some ways we are like children too, right? So here is how this pastor imagined it, the way he wrote it. When Jesus was finished reading what the prophet Isaiah had written, he rolled up the scroll. And Jesus handed the scroll to a man who put it back with all the other holy books. And then Jesus looked out at all his friends and acquaintances and, and relatives, and he held onto the pulpit, as I'm holding right now, right? He held onto the pulpit with his hands and rocking back and forth. And he said, I have a surprise for you. All that stuff that Isaiah wrote about the Messiah? Well, today it is fulfilled. That's what Jesus said from this paraphrase. And so they looked up, kind of mystified what, based on what he said. Jesus was saying, in effect, Isaiah the prophet was describing me. Jesus said, in effect, I am the Messiah. They were silent, the people there, for a minute. They were just looking at Jesus. But then some of the older folks started to smile. And someone said, I always knew Jesus was something special, said one man. I remember when he was just a baby. He had sort of a look about him, you know. And one person said this and another said that, another statement about Jesus and pretty soon there was a happy rumble in their conversation running through the crowd. The Messiah, said someone. Well, isn't that something? The Messiah. 
He, in fact, he, he was the one who made our chairs and our dining table, you know? Uh, I used to talk to him when he worked, and when we were kids, we were playing together. But he did seem to be wise, even when we were young. Others said, oh, I've been waiting for the Messiah my whole life. This is great, someone said. This is amazing, another person said. The Messiah? Really? Someone asked. That one fellow raised his hand and said, excuse me. He said, in a kind of a grumpy voice, but how do we know that this is true? How do we know that he is really the Messiah? You know, what is our proof? Yeah, 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 another said in a doubting voice. That passage of Isaiah said the Messiah will, will do all kinds of cold, cold things, making blind people see, releasing prisoners, but We've never seen those things happening in our town. Plus, said another, it sounds like when he was, this man Jesus, when he was speaking, he seems to have a stuffy nose. If you can really make the blind people see, why can't you cure your own cold? <laughs> this is a paraphrase, right? <laughs> and Jesus said, I figured someone would bring up that old saying, you know, that old saying that says, hey, if you're really a doctor, heal yourself. Well, it isn't quite like that. I am not here to serve myself. Then somebody who really liked Jesus said, you know, Jesus spent the last couple of weeks teaching and helping people over in the town of Capernaum. And Jesus jumped in again, yeah, but don't ask me to do here what I did in Capernaum. It doesn't work like that either. Why not? Somebody shouted. Why not? And Jesus said, because I am not here to do tricks. I came to teach people to show them the kingdom of God. Then someone who really, hasn't really been listening said, I know. I got a cousin who is blind. I run and get him, and you can give it a try, Jesus. Heal him, and we will know that you are the Messiah. That's what this person said, you know, that Jesus will do that. But then Jesus said, no, I don't think I'm going to heal anybody today. Why not ask the guy with, with a blind cousin? And Jesus said, God wants me to invite other people from other countries into his kingdom. Others, said someone. Foreigners, said another. Strangers, said a third. And Jesus said, actually, it's always been like that. Remember the prophet Elijah? In Elijah's time, there was a famine in all the countries around here. There were lots of starving widows in Israel. But God sent Elijah to a foreigner, to a widow in the country of Sidon, a Gentile country. Oh, sure, said the guy with the blind cousin. That happened once. But we are Israel. We are God's people. You should heal our people like my poor blind cousin. Well, Jesus said, it's not the only example. God is always reaching out to people who aren't like us. Think about the prophet Elisha. There were lots of sick people in Israel in his time, but God didn't send Elisha to them. God sent Elisha to heal a general of a foreign army, one of Israel's enemies, Naaman the Syrian. Yeah, that was his name. That really surprised the people, I'm sure. So this man said, so Jesus, you're not going to heal my cousin then? Asked Jesus. Nope, said Jesus. Not today. Aren't you going to do anything? That these things that was read from the scroll, from Isaiah, you will not do those things? 
Not here in Nazareth, said Jesus. Not today. Well, the happy rumble of voices became the angry growl of a mob. Let's get him, someone shouted. And some of the big muscled men came and they grabbed Jesus. What should we do with him? shouted one person. Throw him out, throw him out of the synagogue, said somebody. Throw him off the cliff, said someone else. Things got pretty, pretty scary, actually. They really did drag Jesus out of the synagogue. Then they really dragged him into the edge of the cliff. They really were going to throw Jesus off and to be rid of Jesus forever, to kill him. But just then, a surprising thing happened. Suddenly, the big, strong man couldn't hold on to Jesus anymore. I don't know how that happened, but this is very mistaken. I don't know how that happened. You know, either Jesus suddenly became very strong and those people can grab, grab hold of him or he just miraculously walk like some superpower, you know, walk away. He dusted his dust himself off, walk straight through the crowd for freedom. And that was what the scripture is all about. That's what it says. And uh, the thing is, why were those people so upset? Just because Jesus did this miraculous thing in Capernaum, and they were upset that he didn't do it in Nazareth. It's always good when we look at the scripture to find some context, some of the historical background, and some of the archaeological uh, discoveries they have of Capernaum. So let me show you uh, a map of Capernaum. You can show that on, on the screen, a map of Capernaum. Here you can see the one with the red line. At that time, that is called the Way of the Philistines. Today, they called out the Way of the Sea, or Via Maris, Via Way, Maris, as in marine, you know, sea. As you can see, that is a trade route connecting Israel to Egypt. And in the north, it can go all the way up to Europe, and it can go all the way to Syria. So it's a trade route, and it passes through Capernaum. It's a trade route. Now, when we look at the scriptures, we see that there is this history about Jesus. He was from Nazareth, that's his town, and he decided to live in Capernaum. 70% of the ministry that Jesus Christ did was done in the northern part of the Sea of Galilee, a lot of the miracles. In Matthew 8, verses 5 to 8, let me just go there. In Matthew 8, can we go there? Matthew 8, 5 to 8. This is what have one of the miracles here in Capernaum. Ka Caper means village. And Nahum is like Nahum, the prophet. Although there's no evidence that refers to the prophet, but that's what it is, the village of Nahum. Verse 5. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, a centurion, a Roman soldier, a Gentile, not a believer, most likely at that time, like the disciples. But he came to Jesus probably because he heard of the stories. Came asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home, paralyzed and in terrible suffering. And Jesus said to him, I will go and heal him. Then the centurion replied in verse 8, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go. And he goes. And that one, come. And he comes. I say to my servant, uh, do this. And he does it. Verse 10. And when Jesus heard this, he was astonished and said to those following him, I tell you the truth. I have not found anyone in Israel with such a great faith. Now he's talking about a centurion. Now what is a centurion? A cent like a century, it means 100. He has 100 soldiers. Equivalent to a captain. In U.S. Army, it's a company. It's a company commander, over 100 people, you know. 
I have not found anyone in Israel with such faith. Verse 11, I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast, feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown out outside into darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Verse 13, then Jesus said to the centurion, go, it will be done just as you have believed it would. And his servant was healed at that very hour. What? That is one of the most amazing miracles. A miracle that happened so far away. Jesus didn't even touch. He said, uh, your servant is healed. Is that not amazing? That, that is a miracle. That's the point here is that these are the things that Jesus did in Capernaum that those people in Nazareth were complaining and said, we heard all these miracles in Capernaum. Why won't you do it here? My cousin is you know, this other person complaining and maybe some other relatives. Why not? Why prefer in this case? Another story is, uh, uh, is the story of... Uh, we don't have to go there for time, but when Jesus was there too, he saw a tax collector. His name is Levi or Matthew. And Jesus said to him, come and follow me. He saw a tax collector. I mean, so you can see here that there is some kind of a, something that people didn't like. Here Jesus just told them the story about this Syrophoenician, this uh, widow, this from Sidon, this Gentile, doing a miracle. Then there's this leper who is Naaman the Syrian doing that. And then also they heard this, all these stories of Jesus did and working with the Roman centurion who is supporting the Roman government, probably persecuting all the soldiers, the Jews, which they hated. And another person that people hated, a tax collector, that Jesus Christ would even, would even invite him to be a part of his ministry. Could you believe that? That he would qualify to be an apostle leader, you know, a disciple of Jesus, a tax collector. What is significant about those, those things? In fact, when we look at the story, centurions, tax collectors, the paralytic was, you know, remember that story? There's this paralytic that they brought down the roof. You know, that's also in Capernaum. The kind of people that Jesus Christ was reaching. So to begin to grasp why it was so upsetting, why they were so unsettled, this hometown, this hometown crowd, we need to see the significance of the people that Christ was reaching. People that people didn't like, the Jews at that time didn't like, Gentiles, Roman soldiers, tax collectors, paralytic, the poor, all of this, demon possessed even. They were at the bottom of Israel. They were the lowest of the totem pole, you know, proverbially looking at it. They were far from that social standing. They were the outcasts of the society. Considered unworthy, considered unclean, considered unlovable. Terrorists like these Roman soldiers. By the rest of the world, they hated those. And so for Jesus to, to give grace, because they didn't do anything, to give grace to lepers, to give them love to the widows, was pretty a big deal. You know? And he would not do it in that place of Nazareth. But that's when all, that was not the only thing. Not only was he talking about the outcast, the sinner, the shame, the shameful. He was talking about the people, really. I mean, outside of the Jewish circle of chosen people. Jesus was saying that just like the prophet Elisha and Elijah, just like those people, foreigners, you know, to Israel are welcome to the grace of God too. It's not only in the New Testament, but there are examples in the Old, Christ saying. Not only was God's grace for the losers, like lepers and widows, but it was even for, and especially for uh, widows in this case, women, widow. Not only a Gentile, but one with leprosy. Whoa, that's doubly worse. 
which seems to imply that uh, there wasn't anyone. <laughs> there was not anyone that is beyond the reach of God's love or beyond the reach of his own ministry as a result. Nobody is beyond reach of God's grace. So besides the fact that Naaman, the Gentile <laughs> leper, God loved from Syria. Syria. Of all places. I mean, I mean, does this story sound familiar to us, Christians? Could this be any more timely lesson for us today, this day and age? If Jesus walked into the midst of his homies <laughs> today, <laughs> if he walked, Christian churches, perhaps, I mean, how would we respond? I mean, how would Jesus respond when he comes to churches of Christians? Are these kind of people today welcome? Do we have the same love and grace for people who are looked down? What will Jesus find in our hearts, Christians? Who are the lepers of today? Who are the Naaman, the Syrians of today? Who are the centurions of today? Who are the paralytics of today? Who are those that are looked down and pushed aside? You are not welcome. Many years ago, I remember, you know, pastoring a few years ago, there was even a time when a member came to me and said, I don't get it, Pastor. Why would you allow this person to come to church? He has a lot of tattoo. Another one said, the same person said, why do you allow this person? He was smoking outside. You know, it's the same like you're not welcome. I mean, Jesus would open doors of love and grace for people to come. But, but church members close the door. Uh, kind of the same. I'm afraid the truth is, well, for you and I to think about, will you also get upset are we too busy looking for cliffs? Whenever the message of God's grace and love and mercy is shown to be so wide, his love is so deep, that we get upset and angry. We don't like it. You know? It will upset, affect our young people if you allow these in the church. Is that the case? Who are these Syrian and Gentiles push away and the tax collectors and all these today. That's why sometimes there, in our, our young generation, and God bless our teens and young people, who sometimes get so confused because they see from the church, I mean, not all, from some who have this attitude of claiming to be Christians, and they see that we are so negative about certain people. I mean, isn't that sad? What about today? If I were to ask you, who are the people you don't like to come to church? Who are those people that we kind of look at them and look down on them? Not easy. <laughs> you know, Jesus Christ was almost thrown over the cliff. When he preached, at first when he preached that first half of the sermon, they enjoyed it. Because when, it's, when the sermon was saying that, I will free, I will open the eyes of the blind. People say, whoa, my cousin who is blind. I will do this, you know, free the prisoners. Oh yeah, the prisoners in Roman jail. They were all thinking about themselves. But then realized that, whoa, it is not happening in our hometown. Jesus was talking of something wider than the Jewish community, and they can't just accept it. It's got to be in our community. It cannot be in other places. So sometimes it's not easy to be a preacher. You know, you can be hated. I hope you're not going to throw me over the cliff from what I'm about to say, but I will say it anyway, that some of us would not want others to be welcome to church because they are probably atheists, because they're probably gay, lesbian, LGBT, what kind of gender would not welcome them, because they are illegal immigrants, because 
they are Democrats or Republicans. <laughs> Whatever is the case, you know, we, we all have this kind of prejudice in our hearts. And Jesus Christ is trying to remove, <laughs> remove that poison in this culture because the kingdom of God doesn't have such attitude. And the kingdom of God is love, it is grace. And, and this is not acceptable, a not acceptable attitude of prejudice for anyone, any people. Not. Whether they are Muslims, atheists, whoever it is, that is a created human being, loved by Lord Jesus, who died on the cross for them. You know, but it seems that in the church, gays and lesbians have merely taken the place of widows and lepers. And sometimes we hate also tax collectors, you know. IRS people, <laughs> whatever, whatever it is. It's, you know, uh, we say, well, it will, it says in this uh, Isaiah, we will proclaim the, the, the Lord's favor. You know, that doesn't mean God is going to play favorites. That's not what it is. The Lord's favor is Jesus. And that is what is going to be proclaimed. Jesus and who he is and his grace. And that includes there are others who feel uncomfortable with the mentally troubled people, those who are sick, those who are mentally disabled, all those people. And we are not comfortable with them. That, that's the case. So again, Muslims, like 21st century version of Gentiles in Jesus' day, all those different kind of unworthy, those we fear, those we don't trust, and so forth, you know, we may not realize it, but we push them away, but Jesus has open arms for them. So in the name of this Jesus, the Prince of Peace, this Jesus who turns the other cheek, this Jesus, the Lamb of God who lays down his life for the sake of sinners, this Jesus, the lover of enemies, is causing some people to stumble in the church. Christians have looked down on some with disdain. Love is universal. The love of God is for all. Faith is exclusive. It's in Christ alone. To be saved, we have to be saved in Christ. But the love of God, His grace is for all. We preach grace Jesus gave grace and love so that people will repent. Not the other way around. It's not repent so that you can get, get grace. That's not what it is. God's love is not arrogant. It's not boastful. It's not rude. And I hope that if Naaman the Syrian will come to church, we will welcome him, right? Right? Will we reach out to the widow of Sarifat, who doesn't have anything? We have to be careful while we try to reach out within our neighborhood, our community. That's what we should be doing. But we should not also close our hearts to whoever God wants to, for us to reach out. You know. So the questions for us are the same questions Jesus' friends and family were struggling about the same, the same thing. And I think that's what Jesus Christ is telling us and asking that who are the 21st century widows and lepers and Gentiles? Who are the unloved? Who are the unlovable? Who are the unworthy? Who are those that are unwanted in our society today? Even more, who do you think are, you know, are the people who are just there limited in God's grace. Is God's grace limited? Is God's grace big enough for both Jew and Gentile? What do you think? Or is God's grace limited to us who are the believers? Is God's grace for the Protestant and Catholic? Is God's grace for the married or the divorced? Or those who are just living in? Oh, they cannot be. Will God's grace be for them too? For the unchurched? For the unchristian? For the unrepentant? For Hillary Clinton? For Donald Trump? 
for Premier Xi, for Vladimir Putin? Does God's grace reach them? I mean, I'm saying this because those are the questions we should ask ourselves. Because sometimes when we get into putting, as Jillian mentioned, when our lives, when God is not the center of our life, when we put our selves in the center or our political beliefs, that's when things begin to go wrong. Jesus has got to be the center. He has got to be our guide, you know, Father, Son, Spirit. That's what it should be. That's God's grace. God's grace is given. It is done. It is not up to us to decide who gets God's grace. It is not for us to determine who deserves grace. All we can do is just study and be amazed at what God has done, what Jesus Christ has done, and to celebrate that and to share that. Sure, some people will try, you know, and will try to determine who gets saved and who doesn't get saved. People will do that. We can try to limit God's grace. We can draw a line on the sand and keep the grace and love of God for ourselves. We can even try to silence them, their truth, by hurling these messengers over the cliff, by running them out of town, or by crucifying them on the cross. We humans have been there and done that. And Christ gives us a new way of life, a new perspective that that doesn't belong in the kingdom of God. The life of Jesus, the crucifixion, and the resurrection of Jesus reminds us of God's grace is before us all. And what did Jesus say? He just read it in Isaiah. That grace, that message will bring good news to the poor. It will release the captive. It will restore the sight to the blind. It will set the oppressed free. The Lord's favor, not playing favorites, not being a respecter of persons, the Lord's favor will be proclaimed whether you or I agree or not. Whether you are on board or not. Whether you get upset or not. There's nothing you and I can do to stop the grace of God being shared. Just like those Nazareth people, they tried to stop Jesus. And towards that last part of the story, they were about to throw him over the cliff. And Jesus went his way, did his ministry all the way to the cross, which is the act of grace. Nobody can, can stop Jesus from accomplishing his mission of giving grace to people. That's what happened. So it's a call for us. Grace Communion International, whatever church we belong to, it's a call for us not to be caught standing on the cliff, just like those people in Nazareth trying to stop grace. Because if, even if you do, even if you get upset, Jesus will just pass through you and accomplish what he has always wanted to do. And that is to do the work of grace. What I don't want us to find that, uh, what I want us to find is that Jesus' way of you know, sharing grace, doing justice, and offering God's blessing to a world is going to happen. It's in people's lives. So what's the moral of the story? The moral of the story is, this story is about God wants us to repent, to change our views. Why do we get upset when we hear of this amazing grace and love of God? Change our views and love all. Do you have friends who are poor? Do you have friends who are gay and lesbians and Muslims? Why not? Do we seek them like this widow, this sarapat, and who is hungry? Do we look for them? Just think about it. Because Jesus Christ did. That's how powerful he is. As I said a while ago, the amazing thing is when we read the story of Jesus, 
we get to know more about who God is, but also we get to know about who we are and what God expects of us. Amen? Let's pray. Almighty God, we come to you and thank you, Lord, for sharing to us the story of Jesus. Grace, not limited to one type of people, but he intentionally, Lord, reached out and showed us that in the kingdom of God, everybody, Lord, is welcome. May we, Lord God, be joyful and happy when we see this or when we do it ourselves, Lord God, to proclaim the grace of Jesus so that when people experience his love, his grace, that they may repent. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.